Counting to God, Part 14. We've been discussing the book Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief uh, by Douglas L. Printed in 2014 and uh, available on the net for free. Uh, you can get a hard copy if you want one as well. The uh, cover of the books looks something like this. The, uh, we are now in part three, conclusions, and this is the last part of the chapter 16, which he entitled Connecting the Dots. Just to ref uh, refresh your memory, it uh, is entitled How Does It All Add Up? And there are two uh, uh, short quotes that he begins with, uh, begins a chapter with. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. And then a quote by Albert Einstein, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, the other is as if everything is. And it sounds like Einstein would prefer the second. Now, remember he's concluding with some personal beliefs. And so we're uh, going to skip down beyond the ones we discussed yesterday, although one of them will reappear. Um, and he says, I believe millions have a personal experience of God or of a greater reality. This may not be reproducible evidence in the scientific sense, but it is nevertheless impossible for me to ignore. Um, I think that's fair, you know, once you take the blinders off uh, and say that not everything that is real is scientific is reproducible and most importantly is mechanistic. Then you have to take personal experience at, at least as having some evidence. I've met people who knew the instant a person they loved died even though they were hundreds or thousands of miles away. So he's appealing here to uh, kind of paranormal experiences. No mechanism for that knowledge, just they knew. I've met people who were visited by deceased loved ones in dreams. If you ask persons who work at hospices, I think they will tell you these experiences are common. Many keep these experiences to themselves. They fear others will think they're crazy. Clint Eastwood's 2010 movie, Hereafter, starring Matt Damon, explores how modern culture shuns such experiences. Now he is appealing to um, visitations from beyond the grave. Um, we'll comment on that later. I believe, in, I believe in life after death. I think we are all ideas in the mind of God and if we are a good idea, God keeps us surrounded in some way known only to God. Pardon me, in some way, known only to God. Some recent books and articles describe what it was like to be almost dead, brought to some heavenly place, and then brought back to life. I think many of these stories are true. I take great comfort in them. So he's appealing to near-death experiences. I'll comment on that at the end. Thousands of people have had near-death experiences, or NDEs. Skeptics try to write them off as delusions of stressed brain cells. One study of NDEs expected to find disjointed memories similar to our memories of dreams, but found the opposite. Not only were the NDEs not similar to memories of imagined events, but the phenomenological characteristics inherent of the memories of, to the memories of real events, that is, memories of sensorial details, are even more numerous in the memories of NDEs than in the memories of real events. In other words, memories of the NDEs are more vivid and last longer than memories of real events. Orthopedic surgeon Mary Neal, whose NDE was caused by being underwater more than 10 minutes during a kayaking accident in South America, and who later studied other NDEs. By the way, that's an interesting one. I, it'd be interesting to go back and find out whether uh, she was supposed to have had her heart actually stop or not says people who have been involved in a godly experience remember with clarity and constancy the details of the incident and vividly recall their emotions as though they had just occurred. 
One of the most comprehensive books on NDEs is Evidence of the Afterlife, The Science of Near-Death Experiences by Jeffrey Long, MD, with Paul Perry. Dr. Long obtained descriptions of over 1,300 NDEs. The results are astonishing. More than 95% of respondents stated that their NDE was definitely real. NDEs were reported by persons with no heartbeat and thus no brain activity. And the point that was being made was that you have 10 seconds after your heart stops beating, your brain flatlines. Well, maybe 20 seconds. Um, NDEs were reported by persons under general anesthesia. Even though it is medically inexplicable for anyone to have a heightened sense of consciousness while being at the brink of death. The NDE descriptions from people around the world, from people in different cultures and different religions, and from children as well as adults were strikingly consistent. Many reported out of body experience, enhanced sight, including by blind persons, meeting deceased relatives, and a sense of peace and love. Dr. Long states by scientifically studying the more than 1,300 cases shared with NDERF, I believe that the nine lines of evidence presented in this book all converge in one central point. There is life after death. I recommend, that is, of course, Douglas L., the bo this book. The descri descriptions of NDEs will amaze you. Not all reported near-death experiences involved heavenly beings. Some survivors recalled demons trying to drag them to hell. Howard Storm was an avowed atheist and self-admitted nasty person. In his book, Descent into Death, he describes demons tearing at and eating his flesh and of being rescued by Jesus. He recovered, quit his job, and entered divinity school. I don't know what to believe about hell. Perhaps if God doesn't think you are a good idea, then when you die, perhaps you cease to exist, and that, is sep that separation from God is hell. Interesting, uh, especially in view of the Adventist uh, view of hell. But the Bible speaks of hell. Jesus spoke of it, and some of the near-death experiences describe it. Jesus used the word Gehenna, a place outside Jerusalem where garbage was burned and criminals were buried. From this comes the medieval image of hell as a place of fire and brimstone. Heaven or hell, the near-death experiences all suggest our consciousness continues in some form after death. We do have some type of eternal soul. Consciousness may, be, may possibly be like plugging into the internet. Our brains can partially tap into it, but there is a lot more than our brains involved, just as the internet is a lot more than the computer in front of us. It may sound crazy, but it could explain near-death experiences. Here are the words of John Eccles, a Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist who, just, who studied consciousness. I maintain that the human mystery is incredibly demeaned by scientific reductionism, with its claim in promissory materialism to account eventually for all the spiritual world in terms of patients, patterns of neuronal activity. This belief must be classified as a superstition. We have to recognize that we are spiritual beings with souls existing in a spiritual world as well as material beings with bodies and brains existing in a material world. By the way, those are his ellipses. Uh, probably uh, Douglas L's. I believe the New Testament is essentially an eyewitness account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and of the early church following his death. So he's now switched from uh, talking about near-death experiences to the account of Christianity and of the other church following his death. As others have pointed out, Jesus doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. You either have to conclude he was crazy or that it was actually God as he claimed. Excellent scholarship supports the veracity of the New Testament. An easy read is Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, a journalist's personal investigation of the evidence of Jesus. Of all the facts surrounding the life and death of Jesus Christ, what I find most convincing happened in the upper room following his death. The disciples were in an upstairs room. They locked the doors in utter despair and abject fear. Their leader had just been crucified and they were sure they would be next. Then something happened, something so powerful that they became missionaries and created the Christian church. 
That is all the proof I need of the truth of the resurrection Jesus appeared in that upper room after his death. Now, the note gives N.T. Wright, who gives a lot more detail than Lee Strobel. Uh, Lee Strobel came at it as an atheist, and so that, in some ways, that is a more powerful argument because N.T. Wright can be written off as being biased, but, but N.T. Wright has given a lot of evidence that Jesus, in fact, uh, that, the, that there was an empty tomb and that there were appearances of Jesus, and that's really the, the New Testament proof or the New Testament strong argument that Jesus was in fact resurrected. Now he's going to talk about something else that he believes. He believes, all, I believe all, God embraces all of humanity, not just Christians. Some believe the New Testament damns those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, such as where Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. That is not how I interpret the Bible. Just three verses later, Jesus states, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus then asked, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? I think the point here is simple. If you get to Jesus, you get to God, and if you get to God, you get to Jesus. God and Jesus are the same. There is no Jesus gateway you have to pass through to get to God. I refuse to believe God, this is an interesting theological argument. I refuse to believe God would punish a person simply because he or she was not raised in the Christian tradition or would punish those who lived before Jesus was born or had no ability to learn of Jesus' existence. We discussed that some last week. I find such suggestions to be unchristian. To me, Jesus was clear that God loves us all. I think he goes beyond that. I go to an Episcopal church. I was raised a Congregationalist. After my son was born, when my wife dragged my then atheist behind back to church, we agreed we would visit and compare all the churches in our area. It just happened that the first church we went to was Episcopal, and as I described in chapter three, we liked it so much we skipped the others. The Episcopal Church is a good fit for me. It is rich in tradition and liturgy. I appreciate the intellectual freedom it affords, and I'm proud of its inclusion of all members of our society. But I certainly don't think Episcopalians are necessarily better, or even better on average, than members of other Abrahamic faiths. The people I find most devout may be the Muslim cab drivers of Washington, D.C. Again, I believe there are many paths up the mountain. We discussed that last week, too. I do not claim religious believers are necessarily more moral than or otherwise superior to atheists and agnostics, which is an interesting uh, point to raise. One is reminded of the words attributed to St. Augustine, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum to saints. I believe the misuse of religion historically and today is an abomination. People misuse religion to control other people. That is a special kind of evil, and it is one reason why many reject religion. They perceive religion as being fractious and mean. It is easier to get people to fight and even kill themselves for your cause if you can persuade them that God wants them to do it. This mis misuse of religion is rampant in history from the Crusades to Northern Ireland to Al-Qaeda and many other modern examples. But it is not cause to give up our faith or religion. The greatest atrocities in history have taken place when religion is shut out. Nazi Germany, Stalin's purges, Mao's great leap forward, the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge. These bloodbaths occurred when secular rulers took the place of God. Killing in the name of God is a terrible thing, but far more have been killed in the name of man. Right back at him, I guess. Which brings us to why God would allow this to happen, and more generally, why God would allow so many horrible broken conditions to exist, from cancer to crime to addiction to starvation to war and on and on. As I mentioned in chapter one, others have addressed this subject eloquently, but to me it basically comes down 
to a decision by God to give us free will. In Bruce Almighty, wildly successful 2003 movie com comedy, Bruce, played by Jim Carrey, is a TV reporter who complains to God about his problems, and God lets Bruce play God, except that Bruce can't tell people he is God, and he can't alter free will. Bruce tries to make everybody happy, but screws up and causes problems that lead to riots and loses his girlfriend, played by Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston. Bruce ends up complaining to God about how impossible it is to get God, to get people to love you if they have free will. God, played by Morgan Freeman, responds, welcome to my world. I suspect this conveys a deep truth, that an unavoidable result of free will is that we have the power to ignore God and to hurt each other in horrible ways. When I listen to people complain about why the world is the way it is, and why God did it that way, I think it all basically comes down to their belief that if they were God, they would do a better job. I doubt that's possible. I think free will requires us to accept responsibility and not blame everything on God. God has given us a universe of wonder, and it is up to us to make it a wonderful place. And consistent with the concept of free will and of giving us a choice, I think the existence of God is supposed to be a riddle. I think we are supposed to struggle with the puzzle. If the existence of God were too obvious, then we really wouldn't have a choice. It is a grand riddle, the great riddle, and today, with modern science, we are better equipped than ever to understand it. I think we are supposed to use the gift of human reasoning to detect the existence of God. I think we are designed to do that. Perhaps we are not capable of fully understanding why the universe is the way it is, in particular why suffering exists. It is, a, is it a human conceit to think that we can grasp existence? Does the ant or the shark or the hummingbird understand its world? Of course not. Yet they go about their business just as they are intended to do. Human beings are more, much more. We have been blessed with godlike powers of reasoning and we thirst for understanding, but perhaps there are truths beyond human understanding. When people say they can't believe in God, who would allow so much suffering to exist, they are assuming suffering is pointless. I'm not sure of that. There have been times in my life when I, where I have suffered, but I was better in the end for it. I've had horrific bouts of cluster headaches for 40 years, which each time destroyed my ability to function, yet each time left me with a greater appreciation of life. Senator John McCain suffered horrifically as a, pres a prisoner of war in Vietnam for over seven years. In solitary confinement for years at a time, repeatedly and brutally tortured, he led a life that most of us would find beyond endurance. Yet he has said he would not trade that experience for anything because it was the basis for what he became. When the waters are rough, we do tend to think about the great questions and we often draw closer to God. Often no real adversity means no real character and that is why we tend to think of spoiled children or overly indulged celebrities as vacuous and superficial. The assumption, the belief that all suffering is pointless seems wrong. But then of the suffering of hell. Some, like C.S. Lewis, suggest hell is the greatest monument to the freedom given to us by, by God, to free will. Free will must include the ability to turn away from God and to deny the existence of God. In Lewis's words, there are only two kinds of people, those who say thy will be done to God, or those to whom God in the end says thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. I would refer you again to Timothy Keller's excellent book, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism, for a thorough discussion of these difficult questions of faith. I have taken pains in this book to be inclusive of the other Abrahamic faiths, Judaism and Islam. There are three reasons for that. First, I believe there are many paths up the mountain. Second, from the viewpoint of science, all of the wonders of this book equally 
point equally to all three Abrahamic faiths. You cannot say, for example, that the technology of DNA would lead you to believe in Christianity over Islam. But third, and most important in my view, is that many of us on the belief side of the great debate tragically fail to cherish and embrace our brothers and sisters of other faiths. We believers need to wake up and see the world the way it is. The most significant battle of our generation and for our children and our children's children is not Islam versus Christianity. It is scientism versus belief. We Christians do not have the only pathway up the mountain to God. I believe we are very fortunate to have a path illuminated by the light of Jesus, a path where once you step on it with the intent of going to the top, you are there, you are saved. To me, Christianity is sort of like a fast escalator to God. I believe Christianity is a true path and I believe it offers re reassuring truths that other paths do not share. But it is not the only path. Just as many scientists are locked in a paradigm that shuts out God, many religious leaders are locked in a paradigm that shuts out other Abrahamic faiths. My slim encounters with Muslims, mostly brief conversations with cab drivers in Washington, D.C., suggest to me that Muslims may, on average, be more devout than Christians. They are threatened, as we should be too, by the strong and increasing bias against belief within our society. How did we in the United States ever get to the point where legitimate scientific dis concerns about Darwin's theories cannot be published in high school textbooks? How did we acquiesce in academic institutions turning their backs on founding religious principles? Why do we not challenge museums that put a single fossil on the wall and claims it validates Darwin's theories? How can fairy tales like cumulative selection be considered science? If we are going to make the world a better place for our children and their children, then all Abrahamic faiths need to unite, and the sooner the better in my view, to at least partly stop poisoning young minds with anti-faith claims falsely made in the name of science. We must use science as the great tool it is to help us understand the truth, and we must not be deceived by the hidden agenda of scientism. Let me make three points clear. First, I'm not suggesting we ignore the fanatics of Al-Qaeda. They are murderers hiding in religious clothes. I thank God for our military and all who protect us. Second, I am not suggesting the religious control of government or the media. All I am suggesting is free and open debate and that we recognize scientism as a belief. While we focus on the fanatics of Al-Qaeda, the fanatics of scientism have gained control. Can we think there are no consequences when children are falsely taught that science contradicts religion? Can we think there are no consequences with the popular paradigm of a pointless universe? Third, I am not suggesting all paths of the mountain are the same. I'm just suggesting that the biggest threat to each of the Abrahamic faiths is scientism. Certainly in the present climate, I would agree. We use public money to hand high school students biology textbooks with anti-faith information we know is false. We have known for decades that the Miller-Urey experiment did not reproduce conditions on the early Earth and that the mere existence of amino acids does not solve the information problem of the origin of life. We are ever vigilant against fanatics of religions that we recognize, but by hiding in the clothes of science, the fanatics of scientism are invisible to us. They have gained control over much of our culture and they seek to shut out the wonder. They falsely claim that evidence of design in the universe and in life is not science. It is science. It is just not scientism. When we deny our children the true facts of science, our children are vulnerable to claims that the universe is pointless and that life is but a chemical accident. We watch in horror as they abuse themselves with drugs and alcohol and abuse each other. We watch them walk into public places with automatic weapons and start shooting. We ask, where is God when it happens? I think God asked us why we withhold and deny evidence of design. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been understood and observed by what he made so that people are without excuse. That, of course, is Romans 1. 
Believers are the majority of those living in the United States. We need to embrace legitimate science and legitimate scientific debate. We need to embrace our brothers and sisters and other Abrahamic faiths. There is danger in statements like Christianity is the one true religion. It is divisive. If the question is whether the fundamental claims of Christianity are true, whether Jesus Christ was the Son of God and rose from the dead, I say definitely yes. But if the question is whether the other Abrahamic faiths are false, I say definitely not. The best religion is a religion that gets you closest to God. I think Jesus would agree with that. Thanks for sharing my journey through number, universe, and God. It's been an amazing trip. May your journey find wonder and may your mind and your soul be open to the science of belief. I hope I've convinced you that science is a wonderful tool and that we can use it to count to God. And that is the end except for a couple of appendices, one on uh, uh, exponential uh, notation, uh, which uh, I'm going to skip since I assume that most of us here are somewhat familiar with it. And another appendix on infinity, um, which I'm not sure has any particular deep theological takes except uh, for an interesting proof that mathematical proofs are countable and that mathematical statements are uncountable and that means that mathematically there must be statements in mathematics that cannot be either proved or falsified which is an amazing uh, outcome. But um, as I see it, I'm going to summarize what, uh, how I see Douglas L. saying, and then I'm going to react to it, and then I'm going to let you react to it. Here, Douglas L. opens up about how he sees the world after he has demonstrated that God in overwhelming probability exists. I don't think he would use the word proof, but then in science one doesn't use the word proof anyway. He argues from paranormal experiences, from visitors from the grave, and from near-death experiences. He argues from the biblical account that Jesus was raised from the dead. And once you can't rule it out because you can't rule a miracle out, I think the evidence is really quite overwhelming. He argues again that there are many ways to heaven, although he believes Christianity is the best way. He notes that atheists can be good people and comes close to saying that some of them can be saved. I don't think he actually explicitly said that, but uh, that's where it looks like it's, it's coming. It's going to wind up. He objects to the use of religion to coerce others, but notice that, notices that atheism has its coercers as well. He touches on the problem of evil and attributes it to free will. He notes that free will may mandate that God's existence can't be proved, although I would say that God's existence itself is um, maybe not provable, but certainly arguable by the uh, preponderance of evidence. Um, he notes that suffering may be profoundly valuable in building character and struggles quite a bit with uh, the doctrine of hell. And finally, he sees the most important battle is not one between Christianity and Islam or Judaism, but rather between the Abrahamic faiths in general and atheism. Now, it's interesting to ask the question, well, if some atheists can be saved, then what's the point of the battle? And it's something I think that needs to be struggled with. Um, I agree that the paranormal could be evidence for God. I think that there are some things that are, I think you could say paranormal, um, that imply that the rattling of atoms is not adequate to explain the universe. 
Um, and I also note that the elites of our age are not going to admit that. And so therefore, don't wait for this to be uh, accepted by either Nature or the New York Times. I have more trouble with the dead coming back to visit us. Uh, the biblical picture of death it seems to, be, to me to be overwhelmingly asleep. Um, and I worry about that being evidence of some other supernatural rather than simply uh, uh, what it's purported to be. I have more trouble with near-death experience, and this is one that, um, because of my profession, I actually have some experience in. Um, first, there is the explanation that he notes and somewhat discounts that there are hallucinations. Uh, the brain has to be profoundly deranged just before it is irreversibly destroyed. And of course, if one is being really technical, one has to call them near-death experiences simply because the people came back. And the truth of the matter is that you can show reasonably that death is, in fact, exactly equivalent to brain death, that the heart is not necessary. And second, only about one-third of the people who should have the experience do so. That's something that uh, was noted in one of the uh, earlier sources that I don't know whether it's noted in the source he quotes or not. But that implies that two-thirds of people who have their heart stop are not actually going to make it into whatever kingdom there is. And um, some of those people have led godly lives including my older brother. Um, third, I've, I have never personally talked to someone immediately after his or her heart stopped and he, he or she came back who had such an experience. And that was the one that really kind of surprised me. I was trying to collect data that might suggest as to whether these people had uh, uh, s some kind of experience that implied hallucinations or whether it, uh, or it implied that uh, this was something that uh, they were really experiencing in another realm. Um, and I couldn't find anybody right after uh, the event happened who could remember anything. And perhaps the most revealing one was that I had a patient who uh, went down, we watched her flatline on the electrocardiogram, uh, pumped on her chest, revived her. And I talked to her perhaps half an hour, hour later. Certainly she should have been able to remember. She denied any kind of experiences. I talked to her daughter six months ago saying, oh, you know, um, she didn't remember anything. Uh, daughter says, I can still remember. Oh, she told me all about it. Started telling me about light, and dark tunnel, and, and I just, whoa, where did that come from? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you that it's not quite as straightforward as one might have assumed otherwise. Uh, finally, and perhaps as important, I have trouble building a theology on such experiences. Um, the original ones that were reported by Raymond Moody seem to indicate that the only sin that you would not make it to the kingdom for was suicide, which is fortunate because then you don't can encourage people to commit suicide in order to get this wonderful experience. But I have trouble with that. Um, apparently there are some other experiences now that are being reported where people had, um, if you can call it that way, dysphoric experiences. But 
you know, it doesn't seem to matter what you do. Um, and again, I'm uh, trying to trying to figure out what to do with those two thirds of people who don't have the experience at all. In my experience, most of them, if not all of them. Uh, I don't know that I'm right on this. I am reluctant to criticize L, even if I'm right for several reasons, but I'm also reluctant to take near-death experiences as good evidence for an afterlife. For the simple reason I can't make a theology based on them. Um, I agree with L that there are many ways to heaven, or as I would state it, that God tolerates many and different mistakes in theology, and if you think that's wrong, just remember about the uh, uh, the mistakes of uh, the John the Baptist, who is greatest of all born among women, who was confused about what Jesus was supposed to do as the Messiah, and sent messengers to Jesus saying, what's happening here? John's in prison, Jesus is out preaching, but doesn't seem to be doing anything about it, and doesn't seem to be you know, carrying uh, the winnowing fork in and uh, getting rid of all the chaff. Um, and yet I think that John was inspired by God. I agree that the evidence is, is good. Actually, it's excellent that Jesus was raised from the dead. The only problem is that it, conf that it conflicts with standard um, uh, materialistic theory and therefore it must be discounted at all costs. Once you take that out of the picture, the evidence is probably better uh, that Jesus was raised from the dead than that Alexander the Great lived. I think that Christianity offers a less misunderstandable road to God than other religions. Um, and I agree that atheists have as much or more blood on their hands than Christians. And I agree that the Abrahamic faith should stand together when we can and that dialogue should be aimed at completing the other rather than tearing down. I agree that for now the big conflict, certainly in Western society, is between atheism and belief. Um, I suppose that if I were living in uh, Jordan or Saudi Arabia, I might feel a little differently about that. Um, I agree that atheism is usually not playing fair in the debate between theism and atheism. And I think that the Disbelief in eternally conscious souls makes hell much less of a problem. I am glad that he's holding out for the possibility of a hell that doesn't last forever uh, because I think he's right biblically on that. Now, I think that we need to be very careful with our criticism of hell. First, in some areas we may actually be wrong. Secondly, in some areas, L may move on later or even have moved on by now, and we're criticizing a moving target. Secondly, uh, thirdly, none of us, I think, are saved by theology, otherwise the Pharisee would have gone down to his house justified rather than the publican. And that's a really important point. So I should be willing to tolerate some theological mistakes that L may make. Uh, not necessarily agree with them, but certainly tolerate them. Remember, as I said, that John the Baptist had an incorrect belief about the Messiah. So did Jesus' disciples, for that matter. Remember, as Jesus has come back to life, he's assembling them, and now their first question is, well, God, is this the time you're gonna set up the kingdom? And Jesus said, no, it's not for you to know that kind of stuff. Remember? So the disciples had trouble with their theology. 
Why are we to criticize people who never knew Jesus, who had to find out about God himself from looking at the universe, that he doesn't have it all straight? Now that we've been through the whole book, I think Elle has done us a great service by outlining in either painful or glorious, depending on one's point of view, detail, the very good arguments for God's existence and the inadequacy of materialism. Remember, that's everything except what we discussed at the very end yes, uh, last week and then today. And I'm personally glad to have spent the time we did reviewing the book. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, Ariel. Uh, yeah, I, I want to c commend Al for this book. The, this, the, uh, the mathematical section and it was incredibly uh, well done, I thought, and uh, extremely uh, professional and you know, so convincing. And uh, referring back to today's uh, presentation, I tend to agree with everything you said your evaluations. Um, I wish that he had amplified uh, his concept that uh, evil is due to free will into the context of the great controversy, which I feel is one of the great contributions of Adventism uh, to religion. And it's so well outlined in the Bible, uh, I wish it, it, it's not uh, the primary theme of the Bible, but it, it's, it's so obvious there to a certain extent that uh, uh, as an explanation for the suffering that we see, uh, which he seems to have a problem with, uh, I just I just wish he'd moved more in that direction. But then, uh, who's perfect? So I forget exactly how he said it, but the idea that if the evidence about God was more definite, then that might remove some of the freedom of choice component. Remember? Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. But to me, so again, we have to remember where all this started. It was in in full, you know, view of God, and so there was no discussion. That wasn't the issue, whether it exists or not. So, so knowing all the facts. Knowing the full truth doesn't com still doesn't compel belief. So you still have a freedom of choice about whether you choose to believe it and how you interpret it. So I always am intrigued that if we could just get people to see the truth, well, yeah, I think that's better, but it s still doesn't solve the issue. Uh, so that's that's one point I'd like to make. Um, but yeah, and I thought it was interesting. He got into this idea of that we're an idea in the mind of God. So who was that graduate student that we had here? Some yes, yes. What was his uh, name? Uh, Johann and Ratz or something like that. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of getting back to that. It reminded me of him and that whole thing, so. Well, it does remind me of him, and uh, I think there's a reason for that is because Ratz has taken that conclusion and run with it rather than just standing, uh, rather than just hypothesizing it. Um, I find that uh, the quantum mechanics almost compels one to believe in, in that kind of a thing where you either have a mechanistic universe but God maintains quantum mechanics in it and, and therefore is allowed to move within it, I wouldn't say at free will completely, but certainly um, uh, able to change it at any point in time, or else you have a completely constructed universe. Um, that, is, that is to say that everything that is, is there because God designed it that way in a, uh, uh, in a mathematical Type of uh, type of way, so that, that that we're living in, if you want to put it that way, a giant simulation. Yeah. 
Um, and there's actually semi-experimental evidence for that. And that is that if you get into a sufficiently complex and uh, realistic um, uh, video game, say, you will, find yourself, you will find yourself being lost in the game. You will kind of enter into the experience. It will become at least temporarily reality. You know, until the computer crashes and suddenly you're aware that, no, this isn't reality. This is just what I'm being fed. And it raises the question of, is this really reality or is this just what we're being fed? Well, um, Matrix again, so if you watch those movies. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, physicists who are hard-boiled atheists and supposedly um, materialists will, uh, will admit that they don't really have much defense against the claim that this is a, just a really good simulation. Um, in which case the creator of the simulation is effectively God. Um, and raises some interesting theological questions as to whether the creator of the simulation is in fact God. And then the only real question is what kind of a God do we serve in? And that is, is it somebody who really is all loving, obviously all powerful, obviously knowing enough to be effectively all-knowing. And the only, again, the only real question is, is that person a person that, that loves us or not? Interestingly, that is the major question that is involved with the great controversy. It's not about God's power, the devils believe and tremble. It's about whether God really loves us or not. Who has our best interests at heart. We have a comment in the back there. I think one of the best illustrations of whether or not free will works is the great worldwide experiment in educating kids. We have the belief that if we could just give them enough knowledge, if they understand, they're going to do the right thing, they're going to make the right choices. If that was true, there would be no drug addicts, no alcoholics, nobody would ever speed on the freeway, everybody would eat correctly, and we all know that didn't happen. And yet we hammer it in the kids' heads starting in kindergarten. Education, it does not work. It's not the answer for fixing the world because ultimately everybody's going to do what they want to anyway. I will invite comments. I know we have a couple of educators here. <laughs> I just retired from 42 years. Uh, teaching grades one to four, but 30 years in fourth grade. And having been in this community for 30 years, I've had the opportunity to see children grow up and get married and have children. And some of those children have been my students before I retired. And, and I have to say, it, it really does come down to um, what, am I gonna go with my own humanity? with just so much with us? Or will I latch on, I think that's what you're saying, to that which is outside of myself. I, I've seen good families, good strong families whose children have turned their backs and, and gotten into more trouble and never turned around. And then I've seen good strong families with children who turned their backs but you know, the paint was still wet, and God was still working with them, and they've made, you know, 360 degree, I, I, don't, I don't know. I guess we do what we can. 
Is that what we do? As Adventists or Christian educators, we do what we can. And that's all we can do. Yeah. And, and we can't look back at the kids or the university students or even our own families and say, if I had just done something better, they would have made a different choice. They still ultimately make their own decisions. And, yeah. and, and I think it's unfortunate for teachers to beat themselves up the rest yeah. of the time. If I had just done something better, the kids would have all been perfect. Well, that's not true. Graham Maxwell had. Same way with parents. We yeah. can't say that if the parents had just done it right, because if we look back to the ultimate parent, who was God, yeah. he lost one third say. of his children. Yeah. That was one of Graham Maxwell's um, classic statements. And, and a real, I've, I've shared that more times than I can remember. That he was the perfect parent, lost a third of his children because of free will. I love what you said about criticizing a moving target. That is powerful. And I'd never heard it before. And we're all moving targets, really. We're, we're all, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say all of us, but yeah. those of us who care and are, and are working towards um, quite, you know, becoming um, stronger in our in our in our kingdom walking, uh, yeah, we're well. That's why I think it's really, you know, I I hesitate to criticize people mm -hmm. because people are not ideas. Yeah, that's uh, right. You know, when people have wed themselves to ideas, sometimes criticizing the idea will implicitly criticize the person. But even there, I want to be careful. Uh, you know, there's a saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another one uh, that uh, is less used, and that is, if the shoe fits, grow out of it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what you really hope for. You don't hope for just, uh, you know, uh, uh, now I've got you. The, the, the point of it is, I'm, I'm happy if, I'm happy if everything that I said uh, that, that could reflect negatively on Douglas L. no longer applies. Or if, you know, he listens to this and the next time I talk to him, he's moved on from there. That'd be wonderful. Well, assuming that I've got it right, of course. Um, because that's the whole point of doing this. Is it's not to pigeonhole people into a spot where now they can't get out of it. It's more of a you know, here's a problem with this position. Is there another position we can adopt that doesn't have that problem, that, that doesn't have other problems that are worse? And that's what you really want. Uh, yes, and, uh, and then... Uh, there is a dimension we haven't dealt with. He came close talking about hell, but he never mentions the devil. And it's my understanding that the devil is working for all of us, or in all of us, that he's working very subtly, and yet he must have grand plans, that he's behind wars and horror. This is a, con I'm going to say a contest, but it's, it's more than a contest. It's, it's an influence in the life of Earth and all its inhabitants. And many things that exist exist because the devil created them, influenced them, led out. We live in a scary place. Well, I think there's another th point, and that is that every time Christians get behind some kind of coercive scheme, whether it be uh, that we're going to force other church people to believe in, a, in what we believe in, which is mild coercion, or whether it be that we're going to uh, say that if you don't confess our way that we will burn you at the stake and hope that you repent as the flames come and leap and torture you to death, which is um, on the more extreme side. Um, we give 
ammunition to people who say religion is all about coercion. We cause the, as, as Nathan said to David, we cause the enemies to rejoice. And that is a sobering thought. That the one thing that Jesus said that people will all know that you are my disciples is if you have love for one another. I don't want people to get the impression that I don't have love for, for Douglas L. And therefore I want to be really, really careful about any kind of criticism of him as a person and even being careful about criticizing his ideas. And in fact, I'm going to urge that rather than criticizing his ideas, one might take from this that this is the first natural stage of somebody who realizes that science points in the direction of God, has enough of a Christian background to realize that Christianity has something worth hanging on to, and that this is what you expect. And so look at it as we're going to see if atheism falls, which I think it will, as a reigning power, that you're going to see a lot of people that are just like what Douglas L. wrote here. And I'm frankly encouraged by some of it. Uh, particularly, he's really uncomfortable with the doctrine of hell. I'm glad. Because I'm uncomfortable with the traditional Christian, Christian doctrine of hell, too. Um, depending on how you define tradition. Yes? Um, the problem of ideas, even shoddy ideas, is that you, you cannot destroy them by destroying people who happen to host them. Bad idea. We've already had a second world war against fascism, did we not? We thought we won that one. And here it is coming back. So you see, bad ideas function like infections. Uh, they essentially take over people. People are practically victims of them. Willing victims, to be sure, because how we harbor various ideas is because we happen to like them. Uh, and, and so we, in a sense, we serve the ideas that we hold. And that brings us to uh, what Jesus said, you cannot be servants of two masters. We need to really look at which ideas are worthy of such service and not just go gung-ho about whatever happens to sound good or feel good. I'm not a, a big fan of M. Scott Peck, but I have read a number of his works. And one of the things that I thought was most important was he said the ultimate evil is the need to control somebody else. Well, that's what naturalistic textbooks do. You're right about that. Um, and, you know, I see scientism trying to control science a lot. But I think at the same time we need to back off and ask, are we any better than that? Because if all we do is create our own um, alternative science that uh, has its own controlling factors, we haven't really moved very far from that particular tree. And it suggests we might actually have some of its seeds in, us, in ourselves. Um, 
I do think that uh, God is able to help us with that problem. But I think that it will take constant surrender to make that uh, actually work. And one of the things we have to be surrendered to is God himself. One of the things we have to be surrendered to is love. And a final thing we have to be surrendered to is truth. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. If one sees, let's say, Nazism as racism and contrary to the creation of all men and women from one stock to begin with, uh, and uh, then does one respond uh, with anger and with um, physical challenge when challenged? Because I understand that that happened too. And it gave people on the other side a chance to say, see, they're violent. If you think about it, nonviolence was the hallmark of Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? Hmm. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's the hallmark of Gandhi. It's the hallmark of Martin Luther King Jr. And if we get into the political arena for whatever reason, and I think there are sometimes some reasons for doing so, it should be the hallmark of us as well. Yes, I was just, and a comment here. I was just going to say that um, I have n never seen or heard of such um, debilitating fragmentation of friendships and families as in this current political arena. And so much of what we've talked about today um, it's a good reminder of, of the stance that we should take, and I think that's what you just said, that um, it's just um, beyond sad what's happening to friendships and family members who are politically divided and um, losing that perspective of just downright kindness and love. A couple of comments I wanted to make. First one, it was Sabbath keeping, tithe paying Adventists on a dreadful Friday evening afternoon nailed the Lord to the cross and hurried back home. So they could keep ready the for the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> number one, number two, I think uh, in the medical community, oh, let's put it this way. I was told that 80% of all narcotics are used in this country, in the world. 80% of all, I think you're gonna say yes, maybe it is true somewhere. I didn't take it, but that's what uh, I was I, told. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I was told that. But, uh, well, <laughs> uh, well it, it wouldn't surprise me because the narcotics are used where people can afford them. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, we went up on a medical mission and all we gave them after thyroid surgeries was Tylenol and uh, Advil and people never complained. They, they were fine with it. But it's, anyways, it's well, all talked yeah, about if, if, if you think you have no alternatives, then you just yeah, tough yeah. it out. Uh, uh, however, uh, we are given uh, uh, um, uh, seminars, you know, you've got to know, no, don't cause any pain, you know, you've got to, you know, all of this stuff. But you see what happens, someone goes to the hospital. Well, let's put him on a diluted drip or every four hours or three hours, give it to him. What happens? 
we're making them dependent on these very powerful narcotics. And before mm -hmm. long, they're looking for, today in New Hampshire, 20% of folk there are hooked to this awful drug. So you see, so my, my thought is, what's happening to their power of choice anymore? They have only one choice, give me the drug, no matter how I can get it. Yeah. And but we have been given the power of choice. Are we who have that license to write that? Yeah. You see, are we making these folk, some of these folk, dependent on these medications and really, really, truly ruining their lives? Must give us a pause. Well, the interesting thing of it was that the uh, state of California got involved some years ago in saying that we were just not treating people adequately for pain. Well, and that, so they that's wanted, what I was going to say. <laughs> you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. If you yes. don't give enough, then they're vilified. If you give too much, then we've got this problem. And the interesting thing is that, that at least some of the time, not all of the time, obviously, but some of the time, the people who whine the most are actually the people who really shouldn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, but see, what's happening to their lives? Just a minute, yeah. No, what's yeah. happening to the lives no, of and, these and folk, and of the young people? And, and what it boils down to is people don't necessarily have good judgment for themselves once they uh, experience the yeah. relief. I, I tell the CEO of the hospital, and I says, you can fire me anytime you want to, but I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to give dialogue it to this person. Even they come to the, you know, who's working tonight? Well, we're not going in there. <laughs> I don't care how about the score is and, you know, uh, what's the name of that score? Yeah, uh, yeah, but, the, uh, the patient satisfaction Right, score. right. We're not there for that reason, you see. So it's horrible because we have blood in our hands. Yes, we do. We have blood in our hands, you know, and it's, it, it really, truly is sad. New, I mean, New Hampshire is not one of the border towns. It's New Hampshire. It's a state. State. Yeah. Where 20%, yeah. I'm told, of people are hooked to narcotics. Wow. Uh, and the, the suicide rate, by, uh, the yes. death rate from narcotics is just way it's up there. Horrible. People are starting to realize this is a huge problem. Yes, and it's one we've created for ourselves because we must not, uh, we must not have anybody have any pain. Right. right. And of course, that's not really completely possible. No, we, we, folk wearing white coats are causing more deaths than for than the folk in the streets. Yeah. And you know that, you know. And so uh, again, I'm wondering where does when we do this to the people, what happens to their free will? Because there's none. They're hooked to this medication. Well, as a matter of fact, um, that's one of the things that, uh, one of the characteristics of sin is to destroy free will. Right, there you are, right. Yes? You shall know the truth, and the truth and shall truth set shall you free. free. What does that mean? You're not free right now. That is correct, and once someone gets hooked to it, you know, no faith, no religion, to so many of them, makes no sense. They'd give up their wives, their children, their two-year-old daughter to be molested so that they can get this drug. You are, we know the history, you know the stories. Yeah. And then you wonder, you sit there and says, There are people who have gotten off, even that yes. bad. So yes. there's yes. hope. Yeah. Absolutely, they there is hope. They still have some sort of free will. Well, I'm, I would maintain that they don't have free will all the time. Right. That there will come right. some points where they will have free will, right. and then they had better respond, or because they may not get another chance. Yeah. That is correct. Uh, but anyway, well, next week you're going to find out how uh, the Bible was wrong about the Canaanites. But it wasn't really. It's now in the scientific literature. We'll see whether corrections come out.